Welcome to Siblings Inside. Dang, okay. Okay. <laughs> Greetings and salutations and hello. Hello. I'm Dan. I'm Lisa. And this is Siblings and Zion, the podcast. Hi. Hi. So, lately in the uh, ex-Mormon community, as does happen sometimes, there's something that's either new that comes out of, uh, you know, the active church and it ruffles feathers and kicks up some dust and people, like when Uchtdorf said, who was comparing people to unruly children, Ex Mormons got all up in arms. I'm not. I'm. Oh yeah, this unruly child. I'll show you. And then when Russell Nelson talked about lazy learners. Oh really, lazy learners, huh? Oh, I'll show you lazy. You know stuff like that. And then sometimes there's something that just gets kind of moved up from either the recent or distant past and makes a wave. Makes a newer wave. Yeah. That comes up. And lately, it's been this apparent backpedaling, at least publicly about the doctrine of eternal progression or specifically the the verbiage of becoming gods. And having your own planet. Particularly the phrase or the question, do Mormons believe that they will get their own planet? Yeah. And of course, it's a very careful choice of what to argue. And this seems like a easy straw man because that's not really what we're talking about. That's a, a, a real simplification of the idea that you will be a god over a world yeah. that you populate. Not that you are gifted a planet as a reward for your good deeds during your life, and then you get to you get one. And you get one. Yeah. That's that's never I've not that I've seen or heard is really what they're saying. So it's an easy pin to knock down. Do we believe we get our own planets? No, that's a caricature. They should say is in my opinion. No, that's not quite what we believe. What we do believe is that men, particularly. Particularly. That's all we're ever really talking about. Have the capability to progress to Godhood, to be like God in that you are eternal and have the ability to create, to create your own world, populate it for your posterity. Right. But that's also a very touchy subject. So they don't outright deny it. They just push back against the popular misinterpretation as if it's, you know, really... Out of the blue. Yeah. Well, where did you all get this (laughs) idea? Well, that's, Hmm. yeah. See, that's the problem. There's so many things within the church at the congregational level, like... Caffeine. What what about coffee? Is it caffeine or not? There's been so many interpretations and no clear distinction from where it should be coming from. Right. So it just it breeds this speculation. Yeah. There's a lot of speculation. Yeah. And then I because it doesn't get refuted, yeah. it becomes what you think you know. Right. It's as much a part of your belief as anything else. I didn't realize that that was up for debate. Right. On any platform. So if somebody asked you, say when you were on your mission, and maybe this did happen, someone were to ask you, do Mormons believe that they get their own planet? What would be your understanding and what would be what you, how you would answer that question? That's a good example of how Mormons feel about almost everything when someone asks them about their religion is like, you've heard this supposed idea Mm -hmm. about the doctrine and the theology. Yeah. And then it gets twisted into this preposterously uh, another weird thing question. that Mormons believe. Exactly. Like, oh, do you really wear magic <laughs> underwear? It yeah, gets exactly. distilled into this the magic underwear definitely came from outside sure. of the church, but then it just becomes part of the zeitgeist around something like this. Right. And it's not totally wrong no it's just a it's just a mislabeling of yes. the truth so i feel like a mormon upon hearing you think you're going to get your own planet is just a misunderstanding yeah based on some piece of doctrine yeah a pretty significant one at that yeah and and not not that it's so far out of the realm of what mormons believe it's just presented in a way that makes it sound more bizarre than they think it is yes does that make sense yeah So, 
if I was a missionary and someone asked me, do you think you're going to get your own planet? I would say, well, this really starts with the plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. And I would take it back. We were just taught to bring it back to the fundamentals. God is an all loving heavenly father. You are his child and he has a plan for you and your family Mm -hmm. in order for you to be together forever. There are promises that you need to make and keep with God in order to see the life with him that we believe is possible after you die. Mm -hmm. If you make and keep these sacred covenants and walk the straight and narrow path. Hold fast to the iron rod. Exactly. Endure to the end. Believe in Jesus Christ. Repent. Get married. Keep your covenants. That you will become like God and eventually live as he lives. Mm -hmm. But as far as what that actually entails, I don't feel like there's a lot of information. It then leads to the conjuring of these images like, Mm -hmm. well, God created everything. He created this planet. Well, yeah, but not out of nothing. Right. Is what they teach. And is that what you're going to do if you are living as God lives? That's the implication. It's not like there's a planet waiting for you. Right. You are supposed to be able to attain the ability to organize to do matter such things. in the same way. Yeah. And then are you supposed to have a Jesus on that planet? Was... Yeah, that's, that's where it goes into, it completely falls apart. Yeah. Even if you're even trying to be logical about it. Right. Then it's like, okay, well, you know, create a planet for what? Wasn't that the plan for us? Yeah. And if this just is the plan of yeah. salvation for eternity, yeah. what are we all doing? Yeah. And this is the point at which my religion professors at college would be like, and this is the deep doctrine that really is just too far out of the, the realm of what mm-hmm. we're focusing on here. And that's not important to your salvation. So let's not think about it. Let's right. move on. And Nephi was building a boat. And that <laughs> really, that's really, and that's really important. the important story. Okay. Nephi was a real person. <laughs> so all of this, this recent wave of this, because it's definitely not new. Yeah. Comes from, it It seems to me, as far as I can tell, I don't think there's any new statement about it, but it seems, and it, this might be part of it, that for a time, the gospel topic essay on becoming like God was mm. unavailable. Mm. And, and it, they said it was, you know, a... Like it had been published. Yes. And then it was removed. Or it wasn't available. It just wasn't there. Okay. And they said this it was a coincidence. But then <laughs> there's this resurfacing of this Mormon 101 FAQ, frequently asked questions. This kind of like press kit that they put together. The church themselves. Yeah. And I think it was about 10 years ago. And this has been circulating on the Reddit and whatnot? Uh-huh. Okay. In particular, the answer to the posed question, do Latter-day Saints believe that they will quote, get their own planet, unquote. Yeah. So the answer is, to this one, directly, at first, no. This idea is not taught in the Latter-day Saint scripture, nor is it a doctrine of the church. This misunderstanding stems from speculative comments unreflective of scriptural doctrine. Mormons believe that we are all sons and daughters of God, and that all of us have the potential to grow during and after this life to become like our Heavenly Father. The church does not, and has never purported to fully understand the specifics of Christ's statement that in my father's house, there are many mansions. So no, but no one really knows. Right. As far as that goes, that particular piece of getting your own planet. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's not what they teach. But what do they teach? What do they teach? So the one before that is do Latter-day Saints believe they can become, and for some reason it's in quote, gods. Latter-day Saints believe that God wants us to become like him, but this teaching is often misrepresented by those who caricature the faith. The Latter-day Saint belief is no different than the biblical teaching, which states the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit, that we are the children of God and have children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Through following Christ's teachings, Latter-day Saints believe all people can become partakers of the divine nature. So does that sound like an answer to you? No. Not to that question. So they don't directly answer that question. But the first word in the answer to do Mormons believe they get their own planet is no. 
very so clear. the answer should be no because it is yes yeah but kind of but don't get too excited because we don't really know <laughs> not not that and it is the right question to ask do latter-day saints believe they can become gods yeah. because it's not just because you're mormon and you die mormon that doesn't mean you are resurrected and then are going to be a god exactly there is more to do it's very after contingent that. upon a lot of variables yeah. and ultimately christ is the judge mm-hmm. and it's all about your heart okay okay and your faith and your works and your money and your money for sure <laughs> so kind of a non-answer answer there in in my view and in, yeah in many of the views that have been seen and responding to this it sounds like they just don't want to commit to a yes or a no and is that and is that surprising familiar to you is that mm. really new but this is supposed to be an answer to frequently asked questions and like to set the record straight to the public. <laughs> this is really written, like at the beginning, as an institution, the church has the responsibility to publicly and clearly articulate in its official teachings. In turn, reporters can help inform the public by accurately reporting on the doctrines. But in doing so, journalists should be aware of the common pitfalls. For instance, reporters pressed for time tend to take peripheral aspects of the faith and place them in front and center as if they were vital tenets of the belief, such as getting your own planet or magic underwear. Yeah. Additionally, sincere commentators often overemphasize what others see as different about Latter-day Saints at the expense of highlighting the church's most fundamental doctrines in their reporting. Unfortunately, as many members attest, this kind of journalism paints a distorted picture of the church and continues to confuse the public. Well, was there clarification in that answer, really? No, it's, we need an FAQ for the FAQ. Right. Apparently. Well, that's kind of what I felt like we could do today. Yeah. Because there's more, they're very deliberate in presenting what questions they want to answer and yes. how they answer. It. Yes. And so it's not so much that they're retracting on the teaching that is the teaching that the eternal progression is a huge part of this specific theology. Yeah. And that the goal, whether or not you actually attain it, the ultimate goal is to be like God. Yeah. Live as he lives. Right. So it seems like they failed their own call to action there. Right. Their attempt to clarify. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like it's a lot more clear to me just how vague a lot of Mormon doctrine is when it's supposedly based on scripture. Mm Mm-hmm. So much of Mormon theology cannot be found even in oh, yeah. the Book of Mormon itself. Right. The stuff that really makes it unique. Exactly. Even in the Doctrine and Covenants, a lot of it is not explicitly spelled out the way mm-hmm. that you think it would be, mm-hmm. which is why they put so much emphasis on continuing revelation and modern prophets. Yeah. Because I feel like a lot of it comes from that, yeah. not scripture. It does. And then when it's convenient or necessary... They will use that same principle to kind of brush aside or shy away from statements made by prophets, seers, and revelators in the past if it doesn't somehow align or make sense with later stuff. Yeah. Because we value the current prophet more than anything else. Yes. So even though so much of what is accepted as doctrine comes from teachings outside of the published scriptures Mm -hmm. if at some point that needs to be ignored then they'll say well it's not scriptural doctrine so we can take it or leave it i guess it seems like it varies depending on the situation Uh one example that i'm thinking of throughout college and throughout my mission i remember being confronted with making a lesson plan or having a homework assignment delving into a particular topic of church doctrine Mm -hmm. and realizing that there were very limited scriptural references Mm. to these ideas and these concepts, but not having the insight to then recognize why is that? And doesn't that say something? So one example that often confused me, I'm trying to find it and preach my gospel because the premortal life, I feel like, is a good example mm-hmm. of this doctrine that's not scripturally backed very explicitly. It feels like a stretch. There's doctrine and covenants, Moses, Abraham, and Jeremiah. Which one do you want me to read? I think 
most of what would be in the scriptures is would be in Abraham, right? Right. And Moses is probably Joseph Smith's translation of that. Probably. I'll read that one. The one I'm really trying to find is, I think it's Paul writing that Christ went to the spirits who were in prison. Uh huh. And that's how Mormons, they use that particular phrase to say, see, when Jesus was in the tomb and he was dead for three days, for those mm-hmm. three days, he was in spirit prison preaching to those people who had died. Mm-hmm. And weren't spiritually free. And then also visiting the Native Americans. And then also that. Yeah. Yeah. In this great land. Abraham chapter 3, 22 through 26. Now the Lord had shown unto me, Abraham, the intelligences that were organized before the world was. And among yep. all these, there were many of the noble and great ones. And God saw these souls that they were good. And he stood in the midst of them. And he said, these I will make my rulers for he stood among those that were spirits. And he saw that they were good. And he said unto me, Abraham, thou art one of them. Thou was chosen before thou was born. And there stood one among them that was like unto God. And he said unto those who were with him, we will go down for there is space there. And we will take of these materials and we will make an earth whereon these may dwell. (laughs) Make an earth. (laughs) We make an earth. And we will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. We shall see. And they who keep their first estate shall be added upon. And they who keep not their first estate shall not have glory in the same kingdom with those who keep their first estate. But chosen based on what? How how could they be anything if they're just unformed intelligences? What does that mean? That has never been elaborated on like how could you be anything if you aren't anything and they who keep their first estate shall be added upon like that's been fleshed out a lot in conference talks Uh but i'm saying if you're looking at scripture and you don't have any of that knowledge right that's very vague yep you've got to do a lot of extrapolating and they do so when i was looking at this faq for those bits, I realized how much more was around it. So I figured we could just go through it all and see just how just how much answering they're doing. Despite these complications, the church welcomes honest inquiry from all types of media outlets. The church expects journalists to be accurate and honest and to focus on the faith as it is lived and believed by its members. The church discourages sensationalized and misleading journalism that accentuates abstract ideas that do not reflect the beliefs, teachings, and practices of the church's global membership. What are the core beliefs of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? The founder of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, <laughs> Joseph Smith, wrote, The fundamental principles of our religion are concerning Jesus Christ, that he died and was buried and rose again on the third day and ascended into heaven. All other things which pertain to our religion are only appendages to it. Well, there are a lot of appendages, <laughs> bro. You're like he an just, Indian he God. Just kept Sticking them on there. <laughs> so then there's the basic, like, we're Christians too, spiel. And then there's this FAQ. In response to? In response to the kind of what they see as misrepresentations that they've seen and kind of trying to get in front of it. Like, we put this out there for you. So if you're not paying attention, that's on you. Right. But we clarified. Right. Did we, though? Latter-day Saints believe the church's scripturally based teachings change lives by motivating people to become more like the Savior. Boyd K. Packer has taught true doctrine, understood, changes attitudes and behavior. Hmm. Hmm. With this understanding in mind, the following series of answers to frequently asked questions about the church's teachings should help further illuminate what Latter-day Saints believe. The list of questions is not comprehensive, <laughs> but represents some of the most common inquiries from news media. Are Mormons Christian? Yes. LDS Church is a Christian church, but neither Catholic nor Protestant. Rather, it is a restoration of the Church of Jesus Christ as originally established by the Savior in the New Testament of the Bible. I've never really seen or heard any real justification for that actually being the the case. the priesthood, Daniel. Okay. It's the same priesthood. It's it's because Peter, James, and John came to... Joseph Smith, yeah, right. and they says who Joseph Smith put right. their hands on his head, and they gave him the priesthood that Jesus had given them right. when he was on the earth. So how did they do that? They have resurrected bodies. Oh, and they appeared to him just like 
Moroni did. Sure. Angels. Because Peter was around for a while, but then he died. Mm-hmm. And then all the apostolic keys were lost. Uh, uh, it's called uh, the great apostasy. The church does not embrace the creeds that developed in the third and fourth centuries that are now central to many other Christian churches. Uh, the saints believe God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to save all mankind from their death and their individual sins. Jesus Christ is central to the lives of church members. They seek to follow his example by being baptized, praying in his holy name, partaking of the sacrament, doing good to others, and bearing witness of him through both word and deed. The only way to salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ. What do Mormons believe about God? Very vague question. God is often referred to in the LDS Church as our Heavenly Father because He is the Father of all human spirits, and they are created in His image. It is an appropriate term. Genesis. 127. Good job. Thank you. It is an appropriate term for God who is kind and just, all-wise and all-powerful. Is He, though? Is He all-wise? According to the Temple movie, He has no idea what's going on. (laughs) Yeah, but he He sent us here to be tested and we will see we will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things which Mm -hmm. the lord their god hath commanded Mm -hmm. all we want to know is if you're willing to be obedient that's it who is saying that though is it is it god who is saying that or christ that is a very good question because there's so much mixed up language the lord their god Mm -hmm. i thought christ was the lord yeah the lord and savior Mm -hmm. to christians he is Mm -hmm. and he's also god yep hmm God the Father, His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost constitute the Godhead or Trinity for Mormons. Interesting that they use that language. Latter-day Saints believe God is embodied, though His body is perfect and glorified. Do Mormons believe in the Trinity? Mormons commonly use the term Godhead to refer to the Trinity. The first article of faith for Latter-day Saints reads, We believe in God, the Eternal Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Ghost. Latter-day Saints believe that God the Father... Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost are one in will and purpose, but are not literally the same being or substance as conceptions of the Holy Trinity commonly imply. So, again, there's no yes or no before that. Because really, they're answering the question for Christians when they're asking, do you believe what I believe? And the answer is no. When I say the Trinity, do you believe that they're all one? Mm -hmm. The answer is no. What is the Mormon view of the purpose of life? Interesting. I don't think I read this one. For Latter-day Saints, mortal existence is seen in the context of a great sweep of history from a pre-earth life where the spirits of all mankind lived with Heavenly Father to a future in His presence where continued growth, learning, and improving will take place. Life on earth is regarded as a temporary state in which men and women are tried and tested and where they gain experiences attained nowhere else. God knew humans would make mistakes, so he provided a savior, Jesus Christ, who would take upon himself the sins of the world. To members of the church, physical death on earth is not an end, but the beginning of the next step in God's plan for his children. Yeah. So that does beg the question, if we're going to be populating our own worlds, do we have to set up this same system in order for it to work? Or do we just get to populate worlds and just, like, what? Like, what? (laughs) I've heard a lot of different things. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I mean... Not in the scriptures. No, exactly. This is all from religion classes at college. Do Mormons believe in the Bible? If it's translated correctly. Yeah. Well, it's... it's bitches. It's, it's, <laughs> it says, yes, the church... I mean, of course, do Mormons believe in the Bible? What is that? What kind of question is that? It's one you get a lot as a missionary. I guess. Because they think... What about your Mormon Bible? Exactly. Yeah. They think all we use is the Book of Mormon. Well, and the truth is, I would say most scriptural quotes and lessons and stuff are based on Doctrine and Covenants. Yeah, for sure. I hear that and see that referenced way more than the Book of Mormon. Also, tangent. Yeah? Why was it, didn't they, couldn't they have thought (laughs) of a better name than the Book of Mormon? Right, it it is. He's just the guy that abridged everything. Mm Mm-hmm. In this narrative. Yeah. Why are they mad that everybody just calls them Mormons? Oh, that definitely makes no sense. Like, it could have been called something else. Certainly. That's why it has another testament of Jesus Christ as a subtitle. Exactly. 1980. Why didn't they just call it that? The Bible, number two. I mean, (laughs) what? (laughs) Yeah. The new New Testament. Exactly. The extra New Testament. The church reveres the Bible as the word of God 
a sacred volume of scripture. Latter-day Saints cherish its teachings and engage in a lifelong study of its divine wisdom. Hmm. Hmm. There's, I guess they're supposed to. I don't know if they really do. <laughs> Moreover, during worship services, the Bible is pondered and discussed. Additional books of scripture, including the Book of Mormon, strengthen and reinforce God's teachings through additional witnesses and provide moving accounts of the personal experiences many individuals had with Jesus Christ. According to Church Apostle M. Russell Ballard, the Book of Mormon does not dilute nor diminish nor de-emphasize the Bible. On the contrary, it expands, extends, and exalts it. And quotes it thoroughly. Yeah. Through great portions Copy of the book. and paste. Yeah. A very specific version of the Bible, actually. Joseph loved Isaiah. What is the Book of Mormon? In addition to the Old and New Testaments of the Bible, the Book of Mormon is another testament of Jesus Christ. It contains the writings of ancient prophets, giving an account of God's dealings with the peoples on the American continent. For Latter-day Saints, it stands alongside the Old and New Testament of the Bible as Holy Scripture. What is a Mormon temple? Temples existed through biblical times. These buildings were considered the house of the Lord. Latter-day Saint temples are likewise considered houses of the Lord by church members. So Latter-day Saints temples are sacred buildings in which they are taught about the central role of Christ and God's plan of salvation and their personal relationship with God. And temples. Members of the church make covenants with God to live a virtuous and faithful life. They also offer sacraments on behalf of their deceased ancestors. Mormon temples are used to perform marriage ceremonies that promise the faithful eternal life with their families. Also, I feel like a lot of doctrine comes from the hymn book too. From the hymn book? Yeah. People get a lot. I mean, they're singing these songs every Sunday. And a lot of them have scripture references listed at Mm -hmm. the bottom. Mm -hmm. And some people... I feel like I did this. You sing it enough, you repeat it enough, and that's doctrine. The way that it's phrased and poetically presented. Yeah. Sometimes maybe it's supposed to be symbolic, but it's easy to take it literally. Mm-hmm. I mean, really, the only answer they have for who is Heavenly Mother is the song. Oh. Uh, What's the song called? I don't know. There's a song that talks about her. That's it mentions her. Isn't it about wondering about her or something? Yeah. It's gonna bother me. Well, think about it. Okay. Do Latter day Saints believe in modern day prophets? Yes. The church is governed today by Oh, yes to that, huh? Yeah. Definitely yes. The church is governed today by apostles reflecting the way Jesus organized his church in biblical times. Three apostles constitute the first presidency, consisting of the president or prophet of the church and his two counselors, and together with the quorum of the twelve apostles. They have the responsibility for leading the church worldwide and serving as special witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ. Each is accepted by church members in a prophetic role corresponding to the apostles in the Bible. Man, what a weird existence that would be. Especially if you really believed it. Mm -hmm. That I am akin to the apostles of Christ in his life. But they really don't, they really don't do much to kind of really show that to the world anymore. When was the last prophecy of any prophecy or revelator? It's all just policy changes. Yeah, exactly. But they I just, guess that counts as revelation. They just, they just reversed something. So it's late July right now. Last month, they said that there was going to be no Saturday evening conference meeting anymore for whatever reason. Wait, what? Seriously? Mm-hmm. Only Sunday now. It was specifically Saturday evening. Specifically Saturday evening. Yeah. I think that was the priesthood session. I think so. because. They had, I think it has something to do with because it was broadcast that they don't want to do that. So then just today, they said that after, you know, of course, much prayer and, and ponderance that they were impressed to include a Saturday evening session. But now it's going to be basically just another conference session. There's not going to be, it's not for anyone in particular. Oh, okay. So they're not doing away with it. It's just a they're, different they, they format. Did. They did. Oh, they did. But then they change their minds. Oh. As they are wont to do. Yeah, that's not saying this is going to happen in the future. Uh-huh. That's just organizational, no. administrative. And, and it makes God look so, like, it, like he has no idea what's happening or doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah. Or why are we changing this stuff Why are all we the time? doing this? Why are we making the uh, November 2015 policy and then reversing it for no other reason than public backlash and mass exodus of members yes specifically over that yeah it's oh my father 
Of course, not oh my mother. No. The third verse says, I had learned to call thee father through thy spirit from on high, but until the key of knowledge was restored, I knew not why. Mm. In the heavens, are parents single? No, the thought makes reason stare. Truth is reason, truth eternal tells me I have a mother there. What about that is based on doctrine. There are two scriptures associated with this hymn, but I doubt that they're related to the heavenly mother. Right. That's what I mean. That's right. people getting this in their subconscious yeah. and being like, I heard this somewhere. This must be doctrine. Mm, good point. And it's literally just this person, Eliza R. Snow, yeah. speculating. Right, right, right. They did make a book. Uh-huh. The church does sell a book at Deseret Book called Our Heavenly Parents. Really? And it was like the first illustrated, it's a children's book. That talks about how we have a heavenly mother. Mm. I bought it. Cool. When I was Mormon. <laughs> Remember that? Remember when I was Mormon? <laughs> that was weird. So I feel like they are trying to bring her more into uh-huh. the forefront. Yeah. But still, based on what? Yeah, there's no... You're going to have to make it up. Yeah. I asked about that in the temple. We, we took a mission trip to the Orlando temple. Mm. And you get time with the temple president and his wife. They answer a few questions from the missionaries. So I raised my hand and I was like, what can we know from the temple about Heavenly Mother? Like, is there further light and knowledge to be gained about that topic? If it's so sacred, we can't talk about it anywhere else. Yeah. Surely we can talk about it in the temple. And my mission president was like, the only thing we really have is the hymn, Oh My Father. Wow. Next. I was like, oh, okay. Not what I was expecting. <laughs> Very revelatory. <laughs> I think that's a common theme of members in the church at some point or many. This is not what I was expecting. No. Especially in the temple. Do Latter-day Saints believe that apostles receive revelations from God? Yes. Hmm. When Latter-day Saints speak to God, they call it prayer. <laughs> when, when God <laughs> responds through the influence of the Holy Spirit, members refer to this as a revelation. Okay, that's not a direct answer. Revelation, in its broad meaning, is divine guidance or inspiration. It is the communication of truth and knowledge from God to his children on earth suited to their language and understanding. It simply means to uncover something not yet known. But it's it's not direct communication. For one, it's through the Holy Spirit. And then it's just a feeling that you get. Mm-hmm. So how are you supposed to base knowledge on? that exactly especially if you get a feeling about something that does not correlate with the apostles then you're just wrong so you're bad at receiving personal revelation yep and that is on you the bible illustrates different types of revelation range from dramatic visions to gentle feelings from the burning bush to the still small voice mormons generally believe that divine guidance comes quietly taking the form of impressions thoughts and feelings carried by the spirit of god that's still small voice. Everyone has thoughts and, and impressions and feelings. That nope. doesn't make you n- know anything. No, you only get them when you're Mormon. <laughs> Most often, Revelation unfolds as an ongoing prayerful dialogue with God. A problem arises, its dimensions are studied out, a question is asked, and if we have sufficient faith, God leads us to answers, either, par- either partial or full. Mm-hmm. So vague. Yeah, the answer could be yes, no, or not now. <laughs> Though ultimately a spiritual experience, revelation also requires careful thought. God does not simply hand down information. Yeah. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? You're supposed to seek it out in your mind. I think he used to. I think some people used to get direct information. I think he used to talk to people. What? You're supposed to seek it out in your mind and then prayerfully consider, search, ponder, and pray. Mm-hmm. The first presidency, consisting of the, yeah, you know, blah, 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 and members of the Corman Receive inspiration to guide the church as a whole. Individuals are also inspired with revelation regarding how to conduct their lives and help serve others. Wow, there's a lot of nothing in that. This I found interesting. Do Mormon women lead in the church? Hmm. Yes. All women are daughters of loving Heavenly Father. Women and men are equal in the sight Mm. of God. Are they? Mm. Really? Mm. Because when we're talking about people becoming gods... We're talking about men yep. who then bring along their wives yep. to help them 
populate those who worlds. Bow their heads and say yes. Yeah. And please veil your faces. We'll, we will get to that specifically when I read some, some sample questions, some quotes of Lorenzo Snow. Oh. The Bible says there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And the family, a wife and a husband, form an equal partnership in leading and raising a family. Bullshit. Separate but equal. But no. Different roles. Equal importance. A wife and a husband form an equal partnership in leading and raising a family. Yeah. No, because a woman gives deference to a man who has the priesthood. That is not equal. A woman on her own cannot do for her family what she can do with the husband. But her job is just as important. That is rhetoric because what the church and doctrine actually teaches is they are not. But in the temple, they can give you blessings there. Women have the priesthood in the temple. Okay, so where do you think you got that from? Grandma. Exactly. (laughs) The only blessing that I know that comes that can come from a woman to a man is during the second anointing, which very few people have ever experienced. Oh, I see. From a woman to a man. Yes. Yeah. Women only have the priesthood when it's woman to woman in the temple. (laughs) Oh, of course. Yeah. In the initiatory. But they don't don't really. They don't. They're just They're just performing. They're performing. They're performing an ordinance. And the men let them do that. AKA priesthood. Oh, wow. That, that feels really disingenuous. Because it is. Because yep. it's not true. Yep. What are they going to say? We are sexist. I, I mean, period. Right. But they gave this whole spiel about being honest and truthful and, and clarifying. Yeah, well. From the beginning, LDS women have played an integral role in the work of the church. While worthy men hold the priesthood, worthy women serve as leaders, counselors, missionaries, teachers, and in many other responsibilities. Yeah, bearing those children. They make a lot of j- jello. Mm-hmm. They routinely preach from the pulpit. Routinely preach from the... Sometimes. Sometimes we'll let them go up there and lead congregational prayers and Only worship Only for services. 10 minutes. Yeah. Come on. We got to move it along. Wrap it up. I mean, there's statistics all the time about how many men speak in conference and how many women do, and it's fractional. Mm-hmm. They serve both in the church and in their local communities and contribute to the world. As le- I mean, that has nothing to do with anything. Their vital and a unique contribution to raising children is considered an important responsibility and a special privilege of equal importance to priesthood responsibilities. Yeah, the Relief Society is the biggest women's organization <laughs> in the world. Yeah. Okay. Is it, is it? What do they do? We relieve. Relieve who? People. People who are absolutely miserable in their marriages to Mormon men. <laughs> Lord. Do Latter-day Saints believe they can become gods? So yeah, we... Wait, have we circled back? Yes. This is much further down in this list, but did we but read, it, they read the whole thing? It appears again? Uh, we started there. Okay. So I have started from the... You started from that. From the top. Okay. And now, now we're here again. Okay. So because we talked about how do Mormons believe that they will get their own planet? Is that accurate? No. But will they become gods? It's they have complicated. The Sure. That's it's presented that's the idea. that way. Yeah. Because that's how God himself became God. Ah, see, that's where the King Follett discourse comes into play. Yeah, but that's where they will kind of say, well, it goes back to Lorenzo Snow. As man is God once was, as God is man may be. Become. No, man may be. I thought it was become. Really? Yeah. Oh, son of a bitch. Same thing. Sure. But when Gordon B. Hinckley was in an interview talking about that, he kind of dismissed the first part, but engaged with the second. We do believe in exaltation. That's really important. We believe in that strongly. But the other thing is a couplet from Lorenzo Snow, and it's more of a couplet than anything. But what? See, that's again, that's one of those things that has been repeated and repeated for a hundred years. But somebody later on down the line can be like, well, not so much. And we don't really know about all that. Oh, really? Well, that's what Joseph Smith said. So... If he wasn't a prophet, I don't know who was. <laughs> right. So this is in that uh, gospel topic essay on becoming like God. That was removed. Or it, it was unavailable for a time. Okay. So we moved now. from the frequently asked questions to this essay. Yes. Okay. I think we might have to do, if we finish this, we might need to do a part two. Okay. 
Joseph Smith continued to receive revelation on the themes of divine nature and exaltation during the last two years of his life in a revelation recorded in July 1843 that linked exaltation with eternal marriage. The Lord declared that those who keep covenants, including the covenant of eternal marriage, will inherit all heights and depths. Then, says the revelation, shall they be gods because they have no end. They will receive a continuation of the seeds forever and ever. So right here, answers the question, if they do this, they will be gods. But is the definition of gods in this that they will live forever and have continual seed? Like what's the operational definition of being a god? It's definitely God's lowercase g because they will still have a god, but they will be gods themselves. The following April, feeling he was never in a nearer relationship to God than at the present time, Joseph Smith spoke about the nature of God and the future of humankind to the saints who had gathered for a general church conference, which I, I don't think is actually totally true. It, it was for the funeral of King Follett, but there were a ton of people there. He used the occasion in part to reflect on the death of a church member named King Follett, who had died unexpectedly a month earlier. First name King, last name Follett? That's right. He wasn't actually a king. No. No. This is I so know, confusing. Really funny. I know. And... I've been threatening that we're going to totally cover the King Fallout discourse at some point, and we will. I have a hard copy of it, and I think we might even just read the whole thing and just really go for it. Just really get in there. Uh, When he rose to speak, the wind was blowing, so Joseph asked his listeners to give him their profound attention and to pray that the Lord may strengthen my lungs and stay the winds until his message had been delivered. What kind of, of a being is God, he asked. Human beings needed to know, he argued, because if men do not comprehend the character of God, They do not comprehend themselves. In that phrase, the prophet collapsed the gulf that... This is so grandiose. In that phrase, the prophet collapsed the gulf that centuries of confusion had created between God and humanity. Blessed Brother Joseph. Human nature was at its core divine. God was once as one of us, and all the spirits that God ever sent into the world were likewise susceptible of enlargement. Joseph Smith preached that long before... The world was formed. God found himself in the midst of these beings and saw proper to institute laws whereby the rest could have a privilege to advance like himself and be exalted with him. With. Yeah. Alongside him, I guess. To be like him. Slightly underneath him. (laughs) (laughs) Still above you. (sighs) Joseph Smith told the assembled saints, you have got to learn how to be a God yourself. In order to do that, the saints needed to learn godliness or to be more like God. The process would be ongoing and require faith, patience, continuing repentance, obedience to the commandments of the gospel, and reliance on Christ. Like ascending a ladder, individuals needed to learn the first principles of the gospel and continue beyond the limits of mortal knowledge until they could learn the last principles of the gospel when the time came. It is not all to be comprehended in this world, Joseph said. It will take a long time after the grave to understand the whole. This was the last time the prophet spoke to a general conference. Again, it wasn't a general conference. Three months later, a mob stormed Carthage jail and martyred him and his brother. Hiram. Blah, blah, blah. So this, I, I thought we could maybe read this whole thing, but it's a bit too long. Yeah. But the interesting bit that I came across, mm-hmm. and especially in other people who were talking about this recently. Yeah. In the improvement era in 1919, there's this section on Lorenzo Snow. Talking about all about how wonderful he was. Lay it and on all me. the things that he did. So in this part, it is quoting from the Times and Seasons and the Millennial Star from the King Fallout Discourse. God himself was once as we are now, and is an exalted man, and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. That is the great secret. If the veil were rent today, and the great God who holds this world in its orbit, and who upholds all worlds and all things by his power, was to make himself visible, I say... If you were to see him today, you would see him like a man in form, like yourselves in all the person, image, and very form as a man. For Adam was created in the very fashion, image, and likeness of God and received instruction from and walked, talked, and conversed with him as one man talks and communes with another. They didn't put that in the temple video. Hmm. These are incomprehensible ideas to some, but they are simple. It is the first principle of the gospel to know for a certainty the character of God and to know that we may converse with him as one man converses with another, and that he was at once a man like us, 
Yea, that God himself, the Father of us all, dwelt on an earth, the same as Jesus Christ himself did, and I will show it from the Bible. Huh. What? Yeah, so this is from volume 22, Devotion to a Divine Inspiration by Leroy C. Snow, member of the general board. He's probably related to him, huh? Sounds that way. In President Snow's own copy of The Times and Seasons, which I now have, he drew more particular attention with his own indelible pencil to this part of the prophet's King Follett sermon than to any other reference in all the six volumes. This great hope in man's destiny through strict obedience to the gospel was in his mind so constantly that he frequently referred to it in the home circle, in his public discourse, both when addressing aged parents and when talking to little children, and many of his Intimate friends know it was a favorite theme in private and confidential conversations. So then it moves on to this. Only a short time before his death, President Snow visited the Brigham Young University at Provo. President Brimhall escorted the party through one of the buildings. He wanted to reach the assembly room as soon as possible, and the students had already gathered. They were going through one of the kindergarten rooms. President Brimhall had reached the door and was about to open it and go on when President Snow said, Wait a moment. President Brimhall, I want to see these children at work. What are they doing? Brother Brimhall replied, <laughs> what are they doing? Brother Brimhall replied that they were making clay spheres. That is very interesting. The president said, I want to watch them. He quietly watched the children for several minutes and then lifted a little girl, perhaps six years of age, and stood her on the table. He then took the clay sphere from her hand and turning to Brother Brimhall said, President Brimhall, these children are now at play, making mud worlds. The time will come when some of these boys, huh? He's just lifted up a little girl and is talking but he about says the boys. boys. When some of these boys, in their faithfulness to the gospel, will progress and develop in knowledge, intelligence, and power in future eternities until they shall be able to go out into space where there is unorganized matter and call together the, the necessary elements and through their knowledge of control over the laws and powers of nature to organize matter into worlds which their posterity may dwell and over which they shall rule as gods. So... Pretty specific there. All Mormons need to master the laws of physics. Mm, oh, yeah. I mean, that's stuff that we'll learn. Sure, in the hereafter. Over the eternities that we're going to have in front of us to learn such things. And then we're you know, just going to do some chemistry. A little this, a little that. <laughs> We're gonna go to space. Yeah, we'll just go out into space, find some matter. That's we need to be hanging around astronauts <laughs> and astrophysicists. Everyone present was deeply impressed, and the President Brimhall says that he will never forget the thrill of the spirit of inspiration <laughs> which filled his soul at the time. The thrill. Okay, seriously, why are not all Mormon men majoring in? astronomy and physics. Yeah, I mean, because that, that doesn't matter right now. We're just supposed to be focusing on doing our temple work, raising and our families, biology. paying our tithing, and all that stuff will it's going to be figured out later. You hear that all the time. Why are they not it's all, all going to be sorted out? Reading textbooks <laughs> all day. Because men don't know shit about God's <laughs> eternal plan. Why wasn't that God's revelation? All y'all need to be learning about. <laughs> All y'all. Physics. Hey, there is matter heretofore unorganized, and you need to figure out how to organize it. Yeah. What? There's also the question of, does this belief that God rose to godhood and that we can too, that implies that there's more gods. So another question that could be posed, are Mormons polytheists? And I would say in principle, in totality, yes, because their God has a God. Grandpa but to God. them, in action here, no, because they don't know any of those gods. It's not like they have yeah. in Hinduism, they know the gods and what they represent yeah. and et cetera. Yeah. In Mormons, they have Elohim and Christ and the Holy Ghost, and that's all they know about. But so many Mormons don't understand or don't know that God has a God. And yet that that God, Elohim, says you shall not worship any other gods before me. Uh-huh. I am the Lord thy God. Yeah. It's the first commandment. Mm-hmm. But you have said, and I've heard it many times, that the God of the Bible is Jesus. 
Yeah, he's the God of the Old Testament. So was he giving the commandments? Probably. Hmm. So it he's feels, also the Lord? It feels God? like, it really feels like you can just... Say whatever you want. Consider that, yeah, well, yes. And consider that Christ is the God of this earth. He as, is. Uh, right. Because he's... He, Elohim is so actually not involved. Well, yeah. Apparently. I mean, the whole point is that Jesus was here to show us how to be like his father. Mm-hmm. And then he became like his father. And he was perfected. Mm-hmm. He received a perfected, resurrected body. And now he is our God. He's the mediator between us and Heavenly Father. But under the direction of Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ created our spirits. He organized our intelligences. our intelligences and he created this earth under the direction of right. Heavenly Father. So he's the prototype for the son of God who became God and we're supposed to follow in his footsteps. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So one more bit from the uh, gospel topic essay and then I think we'll, we'll break and we'll come back on the part two and finish this 101 list. How do Latter-day Saints envision exaltation? Since human conceptions of reality are necessarily limited in mortality, Religion struggled to adequately articulate their visions of eternal glory. As the Apostle Paul wrote, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. These limitations make it easy for images of salvation to become cartoonish when represented in popular culture. For example, scriptural expressions of the deep peace and overwhelming joy of salvation are often reproduced in the well-known image of humans sitting on their own clouds and playing harps after death. <laughs> Latter-day Saints' doctrine of exaltation is often similarly reduced to, in media to a cartoonish image of people receiving their own planets. And whose fault is that? Of course, that's what they're going to do. People will paint their own picture if there hasn't been one painted already. Yeah. But they do plenty of brush strokes themselves to create this image. What other vision of heaven do you have besides the vision of I mean, so many paintings commissioned by the church are Christ in the clouds, hugging someone who has just joined the fold after death. Or Saturday's warrior. Uh Uh-huh. Yuck. A cloud and harp are hardly a satisfying image for eternal joy, although most Christians would agree that inspired music can be a tiny foretaste of the joy of eternal salvation. Likewise, while few Latter-day Saints would identify with caricatures of having their own planet most would agree that the awe inspired by creation hints at our creative potential in the eternities let's just read their conclusion all human beings are children of loving heavenly parents and possess seeds of divinity within them god's an embryo as we've discussed yeah in his infinite love god invites his children to cultivate their eternal potential by the grace of god through the atonement of the lord jesus christ The doctrine of humans' eternal potential to become like their Heavenly Father is central to the gospel of Jesus Christ and inspires love, hope, and gratitude in the hearts of faithful Latter-day Saints. Fluffy, fluff, fluff. (laughs) Fluffy love and light in eternity. Marshmallow topping. Ah. Fluffernatter. So, (laughs) again, I don't really know what was the Genesis event for this coming up very recently. But it just continues the confusion in the conversation of Mormons trying to defend the doctrine that is true and that they do or should believe and kind of not being able to fully backtrack out of this notion of being gods over planets, which that is the potential of the creations of God, according to the Church of Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what they were really seeking to clarify even after all of that. Right. What do they want people to think? That they're not that weird. We're not that weird. We're Christians too. We read the Bible. Bible's cool with us, man. But there's so much but more. We, do, we are a bit more special because we are actually the one true church. Our leader actually communes directly with God and receives direct revelation and everyone else is kind of like, eh, they got some truth, but we, we have it all. all. You can have it all too. And it will change from month to month, year to year. Just follow the prophet. And that's all you got to do. He won't lead you astray. 
He would, Except for when he changes he would his never, mind. He would never. Thanks for educating me about that. I had no idea. Hey, man. I don't know. It's really funny to talk about things that aren't real and don't matter, but <laughs> there's still education happening. But it matters so much. <laughs> it's the only thing that matters. It's, I mean, because they know that what it really, when it really comes down to it, it's, a, it's silly. Yeah. And anyone who is honest with themselves and reads the room understands that this church breeds narcissistic people. And in many cases, that is just deep. And it's because you are told that not only is this life not the end, you will be resurrected and live forever. More than that, you could be a God yourself. It doesn't get any more narcissistic than that. That's the ultimate. You are special, a special creation, a special being, a special life form now. The death of your body is not the death of you. Not only do you not die, you've always existed in some form. You're an eternal being. Good for you. You are so important. Now, while you're here, there are beings that are definitely above you and you need to pay into the system your whole life and do as we say, but then you're going to get a reward. You better be Big humble. Time. Yeah. Better humble yourself to the dust. <laughs> you speck of dirt. And in some ways, sometimes I feel bad for people who believe this. So do I. Because they disregard the uniqueness of their actual life, which is the only life they're going to have. And they just totally take it for granted and don't believe it's, I mean, it's just, it's basically a prison sentence. They had a life before this that was much better, and the life after is going to be even better than that. You're right. So we just got to get through this. Endure to the end. Exactly. This sucks, but just wait till you see Just you wait. The rest of this uh, Mormonism 101 thing has some pretty big questions, and I'm curious about how they're going to answer them. So (laughs) please, brothers and sisters, join us for part two in the next episode, and uh, we will give you a further light and knowledge. (laughs) But only if you have the right handshakes. Well, yeah. There will be a quiz. Thanks for listening. Yeah. If you have any questions for us. Please. Send them on over. Shoot them on over. Where should they send? Siblingsinzion at gmail.com or you can hit us up on Twitter at siblingsinzion. Same at Instagram. Friggin' bring it on. I will leave links in the show notes to these articles that I have been reading from and you can check them out for your own damn self and we'll talk to you next time this has been Siblings in Zion I am Dan I am Lisa bye bye